heard about brain mapping. Okay, a few, maybe half. Okay, how about neuromodulation? <clears throat> you heard that term? Yep, I, I know you have. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, okay, so we're gonna get into these concepts in a minute. Um, just to briefly introduce them, so brain mapping is basically a measurement of the electrical activity of the brain. So you basically measure five major brain waves, see if you're underactive or overactive in different frequencies, and then how that relates to different things such as depression, um, anxiety, sleep issues, and so on. Now neuromodulation, whereas the brain mapping is just the assessment, Neuromodulation is actually the set of technologies and tools that we have at our disposal to actually harness the power of neuroplasticity to rewire our brains and increase or decrease various frequencies so we can promote the balance of the brain waves and restore optimal brain health. So before I go any further into that, just a little bit about me. Um, I am the founder of Neuroflex, which is a peak performance brain training and assessment company here in Fort Lauderdale and Miami. So I work a lot with clients who already, you know, have pretty well functioning brains, but they're looking to get to that next level, whether that's in business, athletics, um, they're looking to go from good to great. And it's a concept that is pretty understood when it comes to training in the gym. We all know the benefits of going to the gym to strengthen our muscles and you know improve our cardiovascular fitness, even if there's not a problem. What's interesting to me about the way that people view brain health is that oftentimes, you know, maybe you guys are probably different being kind of biohackers and wellness enthusiasts you are, but a lot of people don't really begin to take action to improve or train their brains until something becomes really wrong. And that's when they seek out a psychiatrist or other mental health professional who might prescribe medications or do some other things. I have a very different approach. So my background is in neurophysiology research and I have a master's in psychology and a couple board certifications in both brain mapping and neurofeedback, which we will talk about get to more in depth in a sec. And then I'm also a certified human potential coach through the Human Potential Institute. So. You know, I focus a lot with the technologies I work with on improving the biological side of the brain activity, but there's the whole other side of the coin, which is the psychology. So oftentimes when you kind of nail down the biology, you get the brain running properly or optimally on a biological level, then it, become, then it can become so much easier to make those shifts in our mindsets, beliefs, and habits. Um, so the psychological component becomes a lot easier. All right, so talking a little about kind of my old self, um, growing up, I definitely struggled a lot with social anxiety. Something like this would have been at an absolute nightmare for me. You know, I would have been fretting and uh, dreading doing this for weeks prior to, you know, a, a class presentation. And, you know, along with that, definitely kind of was very isolated, had a lot of depression, and then when I got into college, I started having these really weird and frightening, uh, what I ended up learning were panic attacks. So at some point along this journey of dealing with these different symptoms, I kind of realized that these were things that I was experiencing, but this was not really who I was as a person at a core level. It was the result of how my brain was functioning biologically. And that's when I went, went on a real deep dive to really understand what was going on so that I can then change and improve my brain. So I began working at a rehab clinic in Deerfield Beach here in Florida. I'm working under a neuroscience director, uh, Dr. Nicholas Dogris, who's one of the top people in my field of kind of applied psychology. And so I really did a deep dive just learning about all of this stuff and luckily after work, I actually had access. We all played around with the neurofeedback and neurostimulation equipment ourselves. So I was able to get a brain map on myself and this was before doing any training. So the map up top, it's basically the brain maps are basically these heat maps. So we can visualize the brain activity, lighter colors. So in this case, the green and a little bit of blue 
is indicating underactivity. And this is in the beta frequency. We'll talk more about beta, but just beta you can think of as really important for energy, for focus, concentration. So I was deficient in beta. And that's also something a lot of times when people have depression, we see beta deficiencies, particularly in the frontal lobes, which is what I was experiencing here. So really just the brain map alone, it connected so many dots for me to just understand why I was the way that I was based on how my brain was really working on a biological level. And with neurofeedback training, um, I basically was training mostly my frontal lobes and specifically targeting an area of the brain called Broca's area, which is sort of on the left uh, frontal lobe, in the left frontal lobe, that's really important for speech production. So that was something I always struggled with and really contributed a lot to my social anxiety was that I wasn't verbally fluent. I would just try to, you know, start a conversation with someone and be grasping for words and like, just the conversation did not flow. I came off very awkwardly and then that made me feel more anxious. The other person could pick that up. They felt more anxious and it's just this visual, vicious, vicious cycle of anxiety there. So with the brain training, I was able to really focus on increasing the beta waves in that area of my brain. Here's another slide here showing up top. These are a bunch of different beta frequency bands. Um, so it was deficient, pretty, um, pretty deficient throughout all of these. And then after training, I was able to greatly restore uh, optimal function of those different areas. So white um, in this case is just showing normal kind of average amounts of activity. Okay. So talking a little bit about brain waves. So who here has heard about oxytocin? Anyone? Okay. All right. So most of you guys. Okay. So oxytocin is a neurochemical. So your brain runs both on chemicals along with electricity. But, you know, in order to properly assess the chemical side of things, we would have to do a spinal tap. Who here would like to do a spinal tap? Show of hands? No? No volunteers? So, yeah, so that's really why in my field, uh, the majority of the time we're looking at the electrical activity because we can do that completely non-invasively with one of these swim cap looking things called an EEG. So this is a 19 channel cap that measures the brain waves at all these different sites across the head. So these brain waves are really driving a lot of different things. Our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors, our mindset, um, our whole state of consciousness, and really the overall health and functioning of our nervous system. So when your brain waves are in balance, we feel good, we are able to get into flow, we feel connected with other people, and we really just are able to experience you know, a joyous and happy existence. When the brain waves get dysregulated, that's when a lot of different issues can start occurring. So some of the things when people have dysregulated brain waves, sleep issues are one of the most common things that I see. Issues regulating mood, um, emotional outbursts, a lot of anxiety, PTSD, worry, you know, ruminating thoughts that keep people up at night, and then oftentimes contributing to poor quality sleep, and then the next day they don't have energy, they're overly stressed at work, and it's just this vicious cycle. All right, so before we get into the brain map, this is just kind of the, what comes first, the brain waves themselves. So. When I do one of these scans, I'm basically looking at a bunch of these squiggly lines on my computer screen. These uh, squiggly lines are basically broken down into their respective frequencies. And all the frequencies have different functions, just like the neurotransmitters, like serotonin is really important for mood and oxytocin is really important for social connectedness and bonding. So in a similar way, the different brain waves have a really important role in all these different aspects of our cognition. So starting from the slowest of the brain waves down at the bottom of the screen, we have delta. So delta is a very slow rhythm that we mostly see when someone's deeply asleep, when they're completely unconscious, your brain is producing a lot of delta. Now, um, in sort of advanced spiritual states, delta has been correlated with kundalini awakenings and sort of this access of being able to 
gain conscious control of what is normally very unconscious. So with all of these, there's sort of nuances where none of them are, you know, necessarily good or bad per se. There's different functions that they serve, and it's important for me to really get people's subjective experience of, you know, if they're struggling with their sleep and we see, uh, you know, a bunch of delta dysregulation, then that could probably indicate that. But if they're going through, you know, a very spiritual, they're a long-term meditator mm -hmm. and they have all these spiritual practices and we see all this delta activity, that could indicate something else. Oftentimes you also see a lot of delta when someone's had a head injury. So even from years past, I've worked with so many clients now <laughs> who've had head injuries from years ago that, you know, that since the injury, they've noticed personality changes, maybe a bit of memory loss, and just not feeling quite as sharp. Now, when they go to a neurologist, you usually get a CAT scan or MRI. It's looking at the structural changes that might have taken place in the brain as the result of that injury. Now, oftentimes that doesn't show too much. Maybe in severe cases, there might be a brain bleed, but oftentimes people will be told that they had a mild, you know, mild concussion just to go home rest. But there are functional changes that are taking place in the brain. Even if you can't measure that structurally with like an MRI, you can see that with the brain map. So that's Delta. Then moving on to Theta, Theta's one that's more closely involved in light sleep where when people are in deep meditative states almost like a trance-like state you can think of theta a lot of emotional processing takes place in this state along with what are called aha moments so these integrative experiences where we change the way maybe we see ourselves or the world around us and just put a bunch of dots connect a bunch of dots together And alpha waves here in the middle. Alpha is kind of a calm, relaxed, what's been described as an idling rhythm of the brain. Alpha is also really important for flow states. So if you guys have ever you know, gotten really absorbed in a good book or movie or maybe your work, you kind of lose track of time, you're not thinking about what you're gonna have for dinner tonight, you're just completely in the here and now, in the present moment. That's mainly an alpha brainwave pattern. And a lot of really cool things can happen in alpha, such as super learning, the ability to really uh, learn and memorize large amounts of information very quickly because our brain is fully attuned and alert. Now beta, beta is our normal alert awake consciousness. The majority of us just having this interaction right now are mostly producing beta waves. So beta you can think of as your thinking brainwave. Um, cognitive processing, planning, you know, having conversations, a lot of the stuff that we do when we're out in the world throughout our days. So that's beta. And then gamma is the fastest of the brain waves that's linked to states of peak focus as well as expanded consciousness. So a really interesting series of studies done at the University of Wisconsin found that long-term meditators actually had greatly increased power of their gamma waves compared to non-meditators. And that increase was actually proportional to how long they'd been meditating. So how many hours they'd kind of logged. So the, the longer someone's meditated, the stronger their gamma waves are on average. And researchers linked that to this kind of increased present moment awareness, um, greater you know, enhanced consciousness that meditators frequently are reporting. So with all the brain waves, um, as I think I was mentioning before, none of them are good, none of them are bad per se. They all have different functions, but when things get out of whack, that's when people start having problems. For instance, with beta waves, when beta is deficient, people oftentimes have uh, difficulty focusing, concentrating, their energy levels are low, um, they just kind of lack that zest for life. Now when beta is overactive, when people have too much beta, which is a very common pattern that we see in you know, most people nowadays where we're highly stressed, always worrying about something, lots of thoughts, um, that is oftentimes can be, you know, lead to anxiety, worry, insomnia, PTSD. A lot of uh, states of dysfunction are correlated to people getting kind of in that chronic stress response, that fight or flight. And on a biological or at least electrical level, how we can think of that fight or flight response is a large amount of these beta brainwaves. 
So oftentimes when I'm working with clients, we're really wanting to reduce beta. But at the same time, when people, you know, someone has ADHD and they're wanting to improve their focus and concentration, we may actually put them on a beta wave protocol. So it's, there's all, all nuances to all, the, all these different things. All right, so your brain can change. Neuroplasticity is really the concept that enables everything I do to actually be impactful because if your brain was unable to change, as I sort of thought a few decades ago, they thought, you know, when we were born, uh, you know, we had all the brain cells we were gonna have. And as we, you know, developed throughout adolescence, there were new connections forming. But then they used to think that once the brain had fully developed, that brain cells just sort of, you know, sort of started dying off as the result of excess stress, uh, toxins such as heavy alcohol use or drug use, and that the brain kind of just started uh, dying away. Now, what we now know is that is completely false. Your brain is actually constantly creating these new connections and pathways, and that is neuroplasticity in action right there. So neuroplasticity, I, I, the reason I have the ski slopes up here is that I think that's a great way, a great metaphor for understanding neuroplasticity. So when we're babies, when we're born, we're kind of these blank slates. It's like a fresh blanket of snow covered a mountain and we get up to the top of the lift, we're getting ready to ski down, there's no tracks that have been made, it's a blank slate. And then as we um, you know, progress throughout our lives, we start thinking the same thoughts, doing the same behaviors, having the same emotional responses, and they become deeper and deeper ingrained the more you know, we sort of think them. Just as with these ski tracks, the more someone you know, goes down them, the, the deeper those, those ruts tend to get. Now, that's not to say that, you know, just like with all these ski tracks on the mountain, that's not to say that you couldn't ski down it and find yourself different tracks and go down a different way, but it can be more difficult. And that's kind of like with the brain, the brain loves the same thing. We hate change. And the brain is trying to maintain this homeostasis, even if that's not in our best interest. So when people get stuck in states of depression and anxiety and just dis dysfunction, that's their brain kind of latching onto that. And even if it's not beneficial, it feels safe because it's something that, that we know that we're regularly experiencing. So it can become really difficult to actually change the brain and harness neuroplasticity to rewire our brains, but there are several ways we can do it. One, that is very popular and you know, making a lot of strides just in research right now is psychedelics. So a big way in which psychedelics are working is harnessing neuroplasticity, enabling people while they're on the psychedelic to experience these entirely new ways of you know, seeing the world, seeing themselves, and lasts in these you know, huge changes, oftentimes even long after the psychedelic is worn off. It sort of puts the brain back into that almost that blank slate, like at the you know when it snows again, and then you're able to go down and travel down all the different paths that you want. So psychedelics, I am a big fan of. Um, I don't work with any of them, but I do work with a bunch of neurotechnologies that have a lot of similarities. We'll talk about those in a sec. Um, first, just to highlight neurogenesis. So this is basically a, a component of neuroplasticity. Neurogenesis is the growth of new brain cells, new connections amongst those cells that's able to occur in the brain. So this mainly occurs in an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is really important for learning and memory. And it's driven by this protein called VDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, neuroscientists have described VDNF as like miracle grow for neurons. So it's a really powerful thing that a lot of different biohacking modalities will actually enhance, such as fasting, uh, doing high intensity interval training, sprints, um, all of those are great for BDNF. And that's also a way that a lot of the neurotechnologies I work with are kind of harnessing neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. All right, so before I get into the neurotechnologies, I have worked with some clients or just friends who've been interested in seeing what happens in their brain during a psychedelic experience. 
So this was a friend of mine. Um, we did a baseline brain map, and then she took a microdose of psilocybin, um, a quarter of a gram, 0 0.25 milligrams, and then we remeasured her brain activity about an hour and a half later. So her initial brain map, we see all of these warmer colors that's indicating a pretty severe overactivity. And we see that pretty globally throughout all the different areas of the brain. Now, when we see a lot of delta in a waking state, that's often indicative of drowsiness and attention. Um, so sort of the brain being a bit offline. When there's a lot of delta, that means a deficiency in blood flow and brain oxygenation. So the brain's not getting the raw ingredients it needs to be performing optimally. This was the bottom image was taken an hour and a half after the microdose. We did another brain map and measured to see what changed. So this delta you can see almost completely normalized. The white is just showing normal healthy amounts of activity. So what I concluded from that normalized delta is that you know this increased mindfulness, present moment awareness, her brain was sort of becoming uh, more attuned to what was going on instead of being distracted and foggy and drowsy. So this was a really cool thing for me to see and then also looking at connectivity. So connectivity basically is assessing how different areas of the brain are communicating with one another and there's both hyper and hypo connectivity. So there can be too much or too little connectivity which basically indicates that the brain is not making uh, the most efficient use of its resources as it could be. So with my friend's brain, before the microdose, she had pretty severe hyperconnectivity. All of these red lines, I mean, they looked pretty bad. She's a very high functioning, like PhD in neuroscientist um, student. So like she, she very much had it together, but her brain map looked very dysregulated. So this was after the microdose, all those lines went away. So we went from the red lines indicating the most severe overconnectivity within the brain to no lines whatsoever, indicating that the brain completely normalized in functional connectivity. This was something really interesting to me because we often hear about how psychedelics increase connectivity in the brain and help all these, you know, sprout all these new neural pathways. But what we saw here was actually kind of the opposite. So it made me start to think about, you know, is uh, are psychedelics or, you know, is a microdose, for instance, almost uh, like a, an adaptogen where it sort of brings our body back into balance. So if it's, if something's too high, it brings it back to normal. And if something's too low, it also brings it back to that normal. That is a hypothesis. I definitely still need to test a lot more, but not very interesting. All right, ketamine. So ketamine is now being, you know, very readily prescribed um, both for at-home use for like lozenges and nasal sprays and then also clinics, IV um, ketamine clinics. I just show of hands, who here has tried ketamine or had a friend that had an experience with ketamine? My son. Okay, okay. so a good I amount. I didn't try it, I was very close. <laughs> hey, you, you can admit it. We're all cool with you. So <laughs> you <admit> it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Did I see a hand up there? Yeah. I just wanted to say one thing about psilocybin. Yes. That, so I'm like, you know, just corporate kind of like Wall Street vibe. Um, I've heard so many people say that psilocybin and, you know, myself included, safe space, um, that it is like the only effective way to like turn your brain like completely off, like the overactive, you know, always thinking, always ruminating, always coming, to, like, trying to come up with new ideas, brainstorming, thinking about that PowerPoint slide, you know, like, all that mm -hmm. activity. Like, what you just described, I've heard so, actually so many people, like, dozens of people, like, share that experience. Yeah. Of, like, you know, it helped me just, like, come back to, like, base. Yep. You know? Yep. So what it really is doing, kind of on a neuroscience level, is reducing activity in a network in the brain called the default mode network. And the default mode network is sort of creating all the stories and thoughts, everything that we're telling ourselves like that may not be true. The default mode network is just spinning constantly all of these stories that oftentimes result in us not feeling great when we're spinning kind of the wrong stories. So psilocybin absolutely can greatly reduce activity in that network and sort of reset the brain. Question. Yeah. Well, what about in a higher dose? 
a higher dose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, because in, in my little audience, I, I do agree with that. But they are not a higher dose. I think the brain just goes into more activity. I don't know. That's something. So the research literature is pretty mixed. They've found a lot of different things, but I definitely want to to get some measurements, so if that's something you might be interested in participating in, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> the helmet, yeah, that's like, like actually the next time. So. Yeah, that's perfect, yeah. Okay, all right, so we our volunteer, we had earlier you, right? Yeah, all right. So you can come on up. All right. So, and what, what's your name? Coco. Coco? Yeah. Okay, so what Coco is going to be trying out is an infrared light helmet. So, infrared light is invisible to the naked eye, such as like, you know, we know with infrared saunas, it's basically this heat energy. So, you, there's a couple of test lights, if you guys maybe, I don't know, in the back can see, but up front you can see these couple red lights, that's basically indicating that the machine is on, but there's it's two not infrared light. It's, it's infrared. Not, it's, it's infrared light, yeah, but this is just indicating that it works. That it's, all, that it's working. The red lights are just indicating it's working. So really, all of, there's 256 LEDs inside of here that are delivering near-infrared light to the brain. We'll talk about that in just a minute. I'm going to start you up here. Question, would you like to feel more relaxed, more stimulated, or like more focused? Do you want like kind of a mood boost? There's different settings we can put you on, so it's all, it's all up to you. Booster. <laughs> what do you think? You what start? do you guys think? All right, all right, the crowd is smoking. Everyone chooses me. All right. Every time. All right, so I'm going to just put this on your head here. So you might feel a little bit of warmth coming from your head by the end of this session. <laughs> it's kind of heating up the brain a little bit. We'll talk about infrared in a minute, but first just to introduce uh, kind of the concept of the field of neuromodulation. So neuromodulation, you could include psychedelics as a neuromodulator, uh, neurofeedback, neurosimulation, infrared light, all these different modalities that can actually change and rewire the activity of our brain. So it's sort of, you can think of it like exercise for the brain. We're working our brains out, increasing energy production, and promoting greater blood flow and oxygenation to the tissues, which makes everything work better. And then also, we're changing both the electrical, electrical and chemical activity of the brain. So what can it help with? Stress, mood, focus, sleep, energy, short-term memory, <sighs> Kind of all of these things can tie into peak performance. I don't know why Leo isn't dancing here. This was supposed to be a gift, and he was supposed to be was supposed to be dancing, but he's just still right now. So. Anywho, he got turned off. Let's see. All right. So the first technology that we'll talk about is neurostimulation. So when I introduce neurostimulation, a lot of people have, you know, sort of the, the their first thought is back to the 1970s or 60s when there was electroconvulsive therapy introduced, you know, sort of one flew over the cuckoo's nest and all sorts of crazy side effects from that. So that was sort of the, the infancy of electric stimulation, uh, very high intensity. Just for reference, the technology I work with, low intensity, it goes up to two and a half milliamps. With electroconvulsive therapy, it's anywhere up to 600 or 700 milliamps. So huge change. Obviously, we know here, you know, where it's like small amounts of, you know, a nutrient or hormone, you know, can be a good thing. A huge amount, maybe not so great of a thing. What neurostimulation is doing is basically teaching the brain to mimic certain brain waves that it may be lacking to restore function. And it puts the brain into a plastic, easy to train state. So increasing neuroplasticity, enabling the brain to rewire itself. There's a few types of neurostimulation. I won't go too deep on any of these, but just to give you guys an idea, there's direct current stimulation, um, which basically runs electricity from the cathode, the negatively charged electrode, to the anode, the positively charged electrode. So there's different montages where you can put the electrodes on in different areas across the head. 
depending on what you're wanting to improve. So for instance, there's a protocol that's been shown within three sessions done every other day that participants with major depression, they showed up to 60 to 70% improvements in their depressive symptoms as measured with like Beck and Hamilton depression inventories as the result of doing this specific montage where it's basically inhibiting the right prefrontal cortex on our forehead and stimulating the left frontal lobe. So what's going on is basically the area that's stimulated, there's more blood flow and oxygen, more activity, and then the area that's inhibited, there's the greater production or greater release of GABA. GABA is our main inhibitory neurotransmitter, calms the brain down, eases anxiety, and promotes deep sleep. I'm not gonna talk about random noise. Um, alternating current <coughs> is basically where we're directly entraining the brain to create whatever brainwave patterns that we're wanting. I'll get into that in a bit more detail here. This is to just show, um, this is a brain map before someone did neurostimulation. We're seeing a lot of overactivity as evidenced by the red, all that red and delta and theta up there. Um, and then a lot of blue sign uh, sign uh, signifying a lot of underactivity in beta and high beta. So that was a baseline. And then after the stim, you can see all of that red and blue went away. So the green and yellow just being very mild overactivity. So the group, the brain in large part was able to really restore healthy function. This is where I was going to get a volunteer. I got you. Okay. So next slide here. So audio visual entrainment, you guys, what was brain tap here? Or yeah, yeah. We have some you guys, tap. you guys have heard about brain tap? Yeah. Okay. So I use a similar technology, a similar modality. But basically with audio visual entrainment, we are entraining the brain into these usually slower brainwave rhythms associated with meditation. It puts people into a very deeply relaxed, almost dissociative state. Um, this increases dendritic growth, um, parts of neurons that um, connect to other cells. So that's a really good thing. Also releases. Yeah. Actually, who doesn't know? I actually got brain tap with me. It's my brain tap. I use it at home. If you want to try, you can come to me and try. So it's really awesome. Or you brain can explain tap. also how it works. Yeah. 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 So basically, you know, using light and sound, um, there's a lot of neurophysiology behind that. But basically, through our eyes and through our ears, we can actually modify the electrical rhythms of our brain. So in a similar way that you know meditation or psychedelics can change the electrical and chemical activity of the brain can also do that with neurotechnology, such as the audio visual entrainment. So you're getting a lot of increased production of these feel good neurochemicals, serotonin, really important for mood. I know you guys talked a lot about that in terms of the gut brain connection, how important serotonin is. And then there's an increase in norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter really important for focus. And then also an increase in beta endorphins which are our natural pain relievers. So this can be great for all of those things. These are levels of the neurotransmitters following an audiovisual entrainment session. So a bit of a decrease in melatonin production, this was just during the day, and then increase in all of those other neurotransmitters. Then there's also the blood flow that's going on. So the cerebral blood flow changes as the result of the audiovisual entrainment. And they basically measured, you can entrain all of those different, you know, we talked about delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. So you can entrain any of those rhythms that you want with the technology. So researchers look to see, okay, what happens when we do, you know, a delta rhythm versus what happens when we do a high, a faster gamma rhythm. And basically what they found was that the largest amount of uh, cerebral blood flow, about a 28% increase occurred at what's called the Schumann resonance. Uh, this is, I believe, 7.8 hertz. And the significance of this is that this is actually the resonance, the frequency of the earth. Uh, so that produced the most uh, significant increases in blood flow, which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, so now talking about what's going on here and how, how, how are you feeling, by the way? Sleepy. Drippy? Sleepy. Uh, sleepy. sleepy. Oh, sleepy. Sleepy. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Nice and warm. Warm, yeah. Good. This is a more energized. That's interesting. Were you already feeling sleepy at all? or? 
No. Not too much. Oh, interesting. Okay. We can all have different responses. So basically, what's going on here? So uh, near infrared light, basically heat energy is being absorbed by the mitochondria, which I'm sure we all know a lot about the mitochondria here. Yep. Mm -hmm. So power plants to the cell that drives increased ATP synthesis, so more cellular energy, and then it also uh, triggers hypoxic or low oxygen cells to uh, release nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a neuromodulator that greatly restores blood flow to areas of the brain that are deficient. So we're also getting neurogenesis and synaptogenesis, so the creation of new brain cells, new connections amongst those cells, the synapses. It's neuroprotective, um, and then also it generates kind of mild reactive oxygen species, which are kind of these cellular stressors for the brain that can push our brain to evolve and get stronger. So there's all these different effects that are taking place as the result of the infrared helmet, but then you're also getting the frequency specific effects. So we can shine the light, we can pulse it at different rhythms. If we wanted to make you feel really, in general, when we wanna make someone feel really calm and relaxed, we do like a 10 Hertz alpha rhythm. Focus, we can do faster, like a 20 Hertz beta rhythm. And you'll actually see, I can show you guys after, you can see the lights actually flashing there that many times per second. So the brain picks up that signal and starts in training to that same rhythm. All right, last few technologies here. So neurofeedback, this is one where we're basically hooked up to different electrodes and we're training the brain to teach, uh, to produce healthier rhythms. So how this would look is you're hooked up and you're watching a movie or something on, on the computer screen. And when your brain is producing the desired frequencies, the healthy brain waves that we're training it to produce, the screen will become clear and the audio gets louder, telling your brain, good job, keep doing it up, doing what you're doing to get the reward. Mm -hmm. Now, when your brain deviates from that healthy activity, you lose the reward. So the screen gets dark, the audio gets quiet, tell, telling your brain, hey, go back to what you were doing to get the reward. And this process is actually taking place within 100 milliseconds. So this is quicker, the, the conscious mind can only process information, I believe it's like 300 milliseconds. So neurofeedback is really rewiring the brain on a very core, almost subconscious level. There's a lot of, there's been a lot of successful applications in the research with neurofeedback, looking at PTSD, ADHD, anxiety, depression, and then also peak performance. So increasing people's ability to access creativity, flow states, um, a lot of high performers are using neurofeedback to trigger those, those different things. How many sessions would you need to... Great yeah. question. Great question. So with all of these, you can think of it kind of like exercise, right? Where if you're not working out at all and you go to the gym one time, you know, you could train as, as hard as you possibly could. You're not going to wake up the next day with perfect physique and, you know, all, all your goals met. So the brain is similar in the sense that from the very first session we do, your brain will start to make those, those changes in the right direction. But as I was saying before, the brain loves what it has always been used to. So it'll try to revert back to homeostasis even when that's dysfunctional. So that's why we need to do repeated sessions to really train the brain to maintain these healthier rhythms. So all the clinicians and people that I've worked under and learned from, we basically start with 10 training sessions. That's kind of the minimum to see really long-term significant changes in the brain waves. But great question. Uh, how often? How often? Uh, oftentimes, like I work with clients usually twice a week. Um, there's different things that they're doing when they're not doing neurofeedback, a lot of things that can make it more effective, but generally sessions are like twice a week. Yeah. Is it necessary to get a brain back before it start working? That's, yeah, so not necessarily, but you you are, oh, and this just finished up here, so I have to take this off It's you. like testing your health. Like you, you, you assess and then you do yeah, counting, you. then you test again. So like a test itself will do nothing for... <laughs> it's not changing yeah, anything. Not, yeah. No changes, but it, it just how you track it. Yeah, so like neurofeedback, when you're not doing it based on the brain map, it can be a bit like shooting in the dark, yeah. you know, where we try these protocols without really knowing if we're deficient or overactive in a brainwave and in what area of the brain 
the dysregulation is really occurring in. So we could try to do that based on your symptoms, might be somewhat accurate, but in order to have the most precision, personalized approach to neurofeedback, we do really need to start with that brain map. Okay. So this was a brain map of someone who had a lot of anxiety, high stress, worry, kind of classic pattern, a lot of excess beta waves is indicated by red here. And then after a round, I believe this was after a round of like 10 to 15 neurofeedback sessions, a lot of that overactivity regulated. All right, so this was a case study. Um, this was a client that I worked with a few months ago. Her name's Annie. She's a 65 year old woman who came to see me because she was struggling with anxiety, insomnia. Um, she was having kind of hand tremors whenever I would see her. She wasn't formally diagnosed with Parkinson's, but thinking, you know, maybe the early stages of that, and then had a lot of trauma. She had immigrated over from Haiti, where there's a lot of gang violence going on. She had been, you know, exposed to quite a lot, and, you know, was definitely having a lot of PTSD sort of symptoms. So her brain map, this was at before training, looked pretty darn bad. We saw you know, pr like lots of red, lots of colors and indicating pretty severe overactivity throughout the brain. So I knew this was gonna be a, a challenge, but I like challenges and I wanted to see what we can do with her. So after we did 10 brain training sessions, and this included go with starting with the infrared helmet and then following it with either neurofeedback, direct current stimulation, or the audiovisual entrainment, kind of a blending of those different modalities, just like if you go to the gym, you might do shoulder press and then leg press, then hop on the treadmill. So with brain training, you know, we also kind of cycle through these different modalities. So after these 10 brain training sessions, she reported significantly reduced anxiety, um, a lot less frequently uh, she was awakening during the night. So her sleep was quite a lot better. She felt a lot more rested and had more energy the next day. And then I was so uh, happy and impressed to see that her hand tremor, she didn't actually notice too much, but I talked to her daughter and her daughter told me that her hand tremor, her mother's hand tremor was only occurring when she got anxious. In kind of rare situations, she got super anxious, she would get the tremor back. But whenever I had first seen her, she was having the tremor. So just to kind of have gotten rid of that, you know, pretty much was, was really an amazing thing to see. And the reason I love presenting this example is this is, you know, a woman in her mid sixties where, you know, the majority of us in this room were significantly younger and our brains actually have neuro more neuroplasticity. It's easier to change and rewire your brain the younger you are, but fairly, you know, even in someone in, you know, a later age, we can still do a lot to okay. change their brain. Like, can we do it for kids? For kids, yeah, a lot of a lot of neurofeedback is being done. Actually, neurofeedback really started in the 1970s to treat kids with ADHD who didn't respond well to stimulant medications. Yeah, because my daughter, uh, nine years old, she uses a uh, brain tap. It's like safe. It's not. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Neurofeedback's the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like when it's the choice of like a prescription stimulant, you know, which is very strong versus you know a non-invasive technology like this it's oftentimes a great place to start um, you know i think i wish that i had this growing up you know i'm really passionate about hopefully um, you know having some kind of non-profit sort of sector of what i do and getting these technologies into school because i think more so than teaching kids how to memorize the state capitals i think if we could teach kids how to self-regulate their brains they would set them up for so much greater success later in life Mm -hmm. Can it increase IQ score? Yeah, there have been some neurofeedback studies showing increased IQ. Yeah. Do we, do we go over the cost of the... Forget <laughs> 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 that. How much okay. is your helmet? <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Okay, I hear you. you don't need to keep convincing me. Okay. <laughs> you, 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 uh, you introduced this, this last slide perfectly then. So <laughs> to, to kind of give you a breakdown, so... I don't work with any of these technologies in isolation. The brain does not really work by just changing one thing. I mean, you might take a supplement and you feel a bit better, but really, you know, how do you create the most change? You know, you get your morning sunlight exposure, you take 
your supplements, you start working out a lot, you know, you do all these things, you stack together all of these healthy habits. So really with the brain, that's really my approach is stacking together all of these really good things. So what the, the two month program that's that I work with most clients looks like, we do pre and post brain maps to first measure and see what is going on in the brain so that we can then put someone on a personalized protocol for their brain along with their goals of what they're hoping to be able to achieve. And then we do 10 brain training sessions, so twice a week for five weeks, um, consisting of all those different technologies I mentioned. And then I'm also giving personalized supplement and nootropic, so cognitive enhancers, um, recommendations based on your brain waves. Oftentimes people will try different supplements and for some people, you know, if you've ever seen like on Amazon, you know, one person will like write this like raving review, this supplement, oh my gosh, like this changed my life. And then you try it and you're just like, I don't know, I don't really feel any different. It's because one person there, they really needed that supplement, whereas the other person, maybe they already had pretty normal levels. So with the brain mapping, we're really able to see if someone, if their brain is running too fast, too slow, where in the brain kind of needs help. So then we can address that with the brain training alongside nutrition, supplementation, exercise, meditation. So um, yeah, all of these things are super important. So basically uh, the last thing is I do like four one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. So trying to help guide clients along this journey of living a brain healthy lifestyle. I really go deep looking through your pantry, making sure you know that you're not eating anything that's contributing to a lot of neural inflammation, giving people like a brain, brain health, uh, brain food, grocery shopping checklist. So really try to put, put everything together into this comprehensive so thing. So actually uh, removing inflammatory food is also part of your protocol. Absolutely. Perfect. So like, it's Absolutely. all like, it's all together. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, because inflammation of your gut is actually inflammation of your brain. Yes, mm -hmm. it causes inflammation in brain. I was so no, it's it's so true. Yeah, it's, at at the most recent neurofeedback conference yeah. I went to, they actually talked about how the, when clinicians see that people aren't progressing with mm -hmm. neurofeedback, it's mm -hmm. almost always because of neuroinflammation, yeah, usually from something they're eating yeah. or you know toxic you know high levels but of stress intestinal permeability in your gut it's intestinal like leaky brain yeah exactly. no, that's, not really, that's what yeah. i call it leaky yeah and then that causes oxidative stress which right. ages you i right. mean it's all connected right so it's like you're not you know in the same way like if you're on a, I, I was i love the workout analogy kind of neuroflex kind of like the brain and muscle flexing the brain you know but um you know uh forgot even where i was going with that <laughs> brain fog. I need to put the helmet on myself. Um, anyway, where were we just going? Leaky brain. Leaky brain. Oxidation. Yes. 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 Aging. Aging. Yeah. So what I was saying with uh, um, working with working out. out. Yeah. I, I honestly I completely forgot where I was going with that. But Aging is a disease. Yeah. Oh. Oh. That like Maybe? so basically. Yeah. The more inflammation going on throughout the body. Oh yeah. So with working out. It's like yeah. if we were to go and work out really hard, but we're not getting enough protein in our diet, we're sleeping two hours a night, we're eating a bunch of processed foods, right. we're not gonna see the changes in our right. physique, right. the muscle mass and cardiovascular improvements that you would if you did all these things to support you know, a workout regimen. So that's okay. how I view brain health and brain training. If you support your brain with all of the things it needs to work optimally, you'll actually greatly accelerate your results. So a lot of clinicians like, you know, who are just traditional, like psychiatrists, mental health counselors who do neurofeedback, and it's kind of just in isolation. It's just the treatment. You go in there a couple times a week for 30 minutes and leave. And I think you can get some improvements with that, but I think it's just one small piece of the puzzle. I think that none of these technologies are the panacea. None of them are gonna cure or help all of your issues, but putting all of them together they can definitely be really powerful additions to your kind of brain health stack. Quality of life. Yeah. And um, yeah, that is the presentation. I'm very active on Instagram, uh, Neuroflex Florida, Neuro without the first E, N-U-R-O-F-L-E-X Florida. You can also shoot me an email, toby at neuroflex.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you have any other questions, uh, please come up and uh, speak to me, introduce yourselves, and would love to just hear 
you know, what Just you guys think. Just all we go into yoga studio now because we are going to have another activation, uh, kind of yoga, breast walk and mantra chanting. And we prepared kind of concert for you. So I will give you uh, mantra.